Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining us for this special program co hosted by the Philanthropy Roundtable and the National Constitution Center. I am Debbie Gatte, the Roundtable's Vice President of Strategy and Innovation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to what should be a very thought provoking discussion about what if progressive, libertarian, and conservative takes on the US Constitution. For those who are new to the Philanthropy Roundtable, a special welcome. A quick word about us, we work with the largest group of donors committed to advancing liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility, as well as protecting the philanthropic freedom for all. Jeff Rosen, president of the National Constitution Center, will share more about the National Constitution Center's work in just a bit. But on to our exciting program. Uh, really, many of us are not satisfied with the status quo, and this is true regardless of where we sit on the ideological spectrum, and some of us actually feel like we should just give up altogether. Uh, there is so much talk about reimagining our democracy, election integrity, restoring a balance of power, and more, but where do we start? Given how divided and entrenched our nation seems, starting this conversation and starting to make some progress seems, well, it seems hard. So this is what our conversation will be about today, and I hope it'll provide some hope. What if we took a look at our basic founding legal framework from various philosophical um, perspectives, and what would each group want to change? What would they want to keep? As we'll hear today, I think there's reason for optimism. The common ground may be clearer than it seems, paving the way for some tangible improvement by consensus. And where we disagree, well, those debates will honestly, they'll keep us, they'll help keep us honest. And we together will continue to look for the best answers as a society. So our program today will have two parts. In just a moment, we'll be having a chance to hear from Jeff Yost, whose commitment to American values led him to provide the necessary funding for this project. And about 15, 10, 15 minutes, with Mr. Yost, we will turn things over to Jeff Rosen, my co-host today, and he will lead a thoughtful discussion with members of the three drafting teams who took part in this project. Teams Progressive, Libertarian, and Conservative. Hi, Debbie, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, how are you? Okay, thanks for having me. Absolutely, thanks for being here. Um, Jeff, I wanna quickly introduce you. You are a co-founder and managing director of the Philadelphia-based Susquehanna International Group, where you are an options trader. Jeff is also a director at the Cato Institute. Now he and his wife, Janine, are also very generous philanthropists personally. They have a special passion for working to ensure every child has access to the best education possible. And as such, they support efforts to improve education policy, invest in charter schools and in organizations that support all of these efforts. Uh, and he also does some work in teacher quality. Now, not surprisingly, they have a special focus on schools in Philadelphia, where they live, but they have also provided much needed resources for national educational efforts. So Jeff is the philanthropist who made today's discussion possible um, at a time when many are concerned about our country's future and know that we need to change something in order to move forward. Jeff is investing in helping us find tangible answers and his financial support for the National Constitution Center made it possible for these three teams of scholars um, that we will hear from today to step back and apply their legal and philosophical expertise to the bigger picture. So thank you, Jeff, for taking a few minutes to share your passion and interest with us. Um, I want to start this, this constitution drafting project, I mean, everyone who hears about it thinks it's absolutely fascinating. What inspired you to support this particular project at the National Constitution Center? Uh, thank you, Debbie. I, I think it came from, I watch a lot of cable news and people are arguing and fighting and people disagree with each other, but they don't get to the, to the first principles that we're gonna disagree on everything if we disagree on first principles and we wind up fighting about the issue of the day, but really the fight is on fundamental principles. So let's back up, let's cool down, and let's hear what each other has to say about fundamental principles. Then uh, it's not gonna be surprising when we disagree on the fundamental principles that we're gonna disagree on whatever the, uh, the current issue is, but at least we'll know where it's coming from and we can have a calmer, a more you know, uh, a reasonable uh, conversation. 
so that's where uh, uh, my uh, my efforts came from. That is that makes a lot of sense. You know, instead of fighting up here about the details, let's go down to what the root causes of some of this is and really have a discussion about that. Wonderful. Um, so now you've had a chance to read the outcomes and the, and the, the drafts of the, uh, the the various teams put out. Was there what surprised you about how this turned out? Was there something that surprised you about the result? Well, one of the things that surprised me about the result when there was the vote, the libertarians did a lot better than I expected. Uh, but uh, I think the uh, it's called selection bias in uh, in our field, and I think people who tune into something about the Constitution are a lot more uh, 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 predicated to believe in the Constitution than most people. So uh, I was happy with the results of the vote, but I think I have to uh, uh, you know, consider it a, a, a biased group. But what I was impressed about, what was hopeful, is that everyone has a great amount of respect for the Constitution. However, the disagreements are, to me, very profound, and that they seem sort of academic and, uh, and, and conquerable, but I'm afraid that they might not be, that these disagreements are so, uh, are so fundamental that we are going to wind up fighting, and uh, the fights will ultimately become irrational. And uh, we do need to dig a little deeper into what we disagree with and then say, well, we really disagree here. Uh, what's going to happen? And what's going to happen is not going to be nice. You know, for example, uh, uh, you know, the libertarians would say there's freedom and the progressives would say there's freedom from want, you know, which is a, a, a Roosevelt idea that the Constitution guarantees you freedom, but you're not free if you're poor. Well, if that's the case, then uh, if you have a desire, you have the right to take something from somebody else. Now, this is going to lead to, you know, a, a completely different uh, world uh, than the one that I think that was originally intended uh, by the framers. Now, maybe that world is better. So what I want to talk about is we all have different views of what the Constitution should be. But we don't, but you know, everyone tries to say, well, the Constitution says this, the Constitution says that. Instead of having a seance about what the founders actually would have said if they were here, which is just mere speculation, why don't we talk about, well, if we were starting a new country today, what would the Constitution look like? Where would you go live? Is your want a moral claim on someone else's stuff? I think that most people would say, yes, it is. I think the founders would say no, the libertarians would certainly say no. So that to me is the major divide, is the major dividing line. And we shouldn't be surprised when we try and squish two completely different philosophies together that we get a lot of friction and a lot of hostility and a lot of inefficiency. So that to me is the root of the problem. Uh, and it needs to be discussed in a calm, rational way and not be surprised when, well, if we have this fundamental disagreement, guess what? Uh, we're going to be disagreeing constantly and fighting uh, forever. Yes. Yeah, so to go back to what you, you said at the beginning of the answer, one of the really hopeful things is from all sides, there was a deep respect for the Constitution as a guiding document. And then this, this opportunity allowed for that stepping back and to exactly do what you described. If we were doing this from scratch, We've got some great stuff in front of us to, to reference, but what would we do? What would we do today? So that I think is the, the crux of the, the project and it should lead to a really great discussion with our panel in a moment. But I have two more quick questions for you. One, and, and you said something about maybe some bias here. So given your personal, your personal views of the world, did you um, have a preference for one of the drafts yourself? Was there one that resonated more with you? Oh yeah, uh, clearly the libertarian constitution is the one that I uh, that I support. I mean, everyone should know that. I love Ilya Shapiro's line that uh, uh, how would you amend the constitution? They would just add, and we really mean it to the end of every amendment. So uh, in my mind, there's no way you can read the ninth and tenth amendment and not realize that the powers of the government are very, very limited, and we've gone way outside uh, uh, that expansion. So to me, the libertarian constitution, the constitution is a libertarian document and it's morphed into a conservative or progressive document, really more progressive over, uh, as is interpreted over the years. Uh, so uh, I have a clear preference for uh, the libertarian constitution, but I was really uh, 
uh, cheered up by the constitution that I most disagree with, the progressive constitution, was that it was a lot more articulate, a lot more thoughtful and enlightening to me uh, than I would have uh, than I would have thought. So really, truly the basis of conversation, because we're already learning just by reading the output from the three drafts. So, so that is that's very positive. Now, I, I'm with the philanthropy roundtable. Uh, your gift to the National Constitution Center was an act of philanthropy. Given what you've been thinking about, and given that you think we really need to have this conversation about the areas of difference going forward, I'm curious what you think philanthropy can do to help move this along. Well, I think what philanthropy can do is, uh, is get to the root of the problem. Uh, and you know, I try and make you know, philanthrop philanthropic contributions to be as productive as if it was a, you know, an investment. And to me, the greatest gift uh, of modern times was the Constitution. That when you look at America, it had no reason to be successful. It was really people coming over here fleeing for no reason. Why should this country be the freest, most prosperous country uh, in, in history. Uh, what did it have? The land was okay. It's not great. The weather's not great. There's nothing about America that if I was a gambling man in 1700, that I would say this is going to work. You know, uh, no way. If a bunch of immigrants went to some other place on earth now, I wouldn't be betting on it. that they left behind so many institutions, so much knowledge, and, you know, so much comfort. So what did it? Uh, it was the Constitution. It was just an absolute miracle of, uh, of, 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 of modern man and that it should be cherished and it should be, it should be thought of like, this is what did it. There's nothing special about America or there is nothing special about Americans really except for a love of the constitution. And if the constitution was practiced in other countries, it, they would prosper too. I mean, what's the difference between us and the other countries in the world? We're not better than these other people. Uh, we just have a much, much better constitution. So my philanthropy is that is the root of hundreds of trillions of dollars of wealth and prosperity and joy. And if we can just get people to like the constitution, maybe you know, tweak it a teeny bit because we've learned some stuff over 250 years. Uh, but if we can get that constitution out to the rest of the world, we can live in a, uh, in a peaceful and prosperous world that is almost, would be almost unimaginable the way America is basically an unimaginable uh, miracle compared to what you know, life looked like uh, 300 years ago. Very well said, and thank you. Thank you for that and very inspiring um, perspective. And you're right, there is not much here in America. And back then, there was not much here to make this the place where all this would happen. The Constitution represents all of those ideals put into a document. So Jeff, I really wanna thank you for joining us today and sharing what inspired you and what your interests are and where you're hoping this will go. Um, thanks for joining us. And we're going to move on to the, the main program now so that we can hear all about these three drafts and what it is that they had in common and what they had different. Jeff Rosen is the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center and a law professor at George Washington University. He's also a contributing author at The Atlantic, where you can actually find a great article about the Constitution Drafting Project. And he, the last book he wrote was about conversations with RBG. So Jeff, please take it away and I'll see you later. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you so much, Jeff, for making this inspiring initiative possible. And thanks for summing up the mission so well. As you just said, if we can get people to like the Constitution and get that Constitution out to the world, we can live in a peaceful and prosperous world. Um, that is exactly right. Uh, friends, welcome to this program, uh, which is co-sponsored by the Philanthropy Roundtable and the National Constitution Center. Uh, at the Constitution Center, we'd like to begin all of our programs by uh, beginning with the inspiring mission statement of the center to uh, get us uh, elevated for the conversation ahead. So here we go. And those of you who have been here before can recite along with me. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. It is such a meaningful mission and Jeff's project inspiring us to return to first principles and to convene some of the most thoughtful scholars in America of different perspectives, conservative, libertarian, and progressive, to explore areas of agreement and disagreement about first principles is central to our educational mission. 
I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we're going to um, jump right into the conversation. Carolyn Fredrickson, uh, the leader of Team Progressive, is a visiting professor at Georgetown Law School. She served as president of the American Constitution Society from 2009 to 2019, and is the author of many books, including uh, most recently, The AOC Way. Uh, Ilya Shapiro, who led Team Libertarian, is director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. His most recent book is Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations, and the Politics of America's Highest Court. And Ilan Worman, who led Team Conservative, is associate professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. He is the author of A Debt Against the Living, an Introduction to Originalism, and The Second Founding, an Introduction to the 14th Amendment. Caroline, Ilya, Ilan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Good to be with you again, Jeff. It, it's so great. We've convened several times to discuss this incredibly successful project. We've discussed the surprising areas of agreement among all of you. And to cut to the chase, I think all of us, uh, at least all of us at the Constitution Center, were surprised that teams conservative and progressive converged around two proposed amendments, namely term limits for Supreme Court justices and a national popular vote for president. And all three teams uh, converged on the need to limit executive power. Uh, although you disagreed about some of the details. Here's what I want to do in this conversation. First, uh, in an opening round, give each of you a chance to introduce the essence of your constitution and the principles that you proposed. Second, I want to think about how to move this important conversation forward. I would like to keep this initiative going over the next year. What Jeff Yas started um, should be continued. So uh, if we can uh, get support for the effort, um, I would like to think with you about convening discussions about how to strengthen the guardrails of democracy so that we can increase thoughtful Madisonian deliberation of the kind that all the founders thought was necessary for the Republic to succeed and that Jeff Yass um, signaled was the essence of his goal in, in creating our project. And then I wanna um, take the audience questions. Okay, so let's begin. Um, Caroline, the uh, Team Progressive uh, said that you were focused on two values in particular, namely democracy and equality. Tell us about those values and some of the important proposals in the Progressive Constitution. Absolutely, and, and, and thank you all um, for coming. I know we have an incredibly large audience and thank the Jeffs for these great introductions um, and for the support for the project. It has been tremendously um, interesting and stimulating and uh, great to work with Ilya and Elon um, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in agreeing on some things and mostly disagreeing on others, but always in a very civil way. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so what, what, you know, people I think, you know, might have been surprised in some ways by our constitution in that um, we had a fairly light touch um, relative to um, what people might have expected. Um, we, um, we approached this uh, under the, um, in part, we really wanted to speak to, um, to the public uh, and not to an academic uh, audience um, uh, uh, to, to, to really engage with, the, with issues that are in front of Americans right now about our democracy uh, and to engage them directly in questions about where the Constitution um, could be, um, uh, in, our, in our views, improved. And so that is why we really did focus on equality and democracy. Uh, and even in, um, in the, uh, with the focus on equality, um, we see that um, mostly within the framework of the, um, the Constitution that we have. That is, the stronger the democracy, uh, the stronger the equality protections that will come. Um, um, so structural fixes tended to be our major focus. Um, uh, we kept the basic elements of separation of powers, which we thought were very important to um, protecting uh, 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 democratic and uh, equality and liberty, um, which is of course also a value um, that we share with, um, with, with uh, the conservatives and libertarians, um, we may envision it in somewhat of a different way. 
Um, but so that that was sort of what brought us to this. We thought that 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 kind of elemental um, uh, framework of separation of powers, uh, the need to speak to um, issues that are in front of the American public now, um, and not um, simply come at this as a kind of an academic ac academic exercise. Um, but really engage with um, things that we say. I think in certainly the last um, several months have, have put these questions ar around democracy and whether we have the guardrails that you mentioned uh, in a much under a much brighter spotlight. Uh, and I think this project and the discussions that we have really helps that. And the fact that we've had so many areas of agreement at least around the sort of general um, uh, conceptions of where that their uh, executive power um, needs to be reined in, that the legislature is uh, somewhat uh, too weak right now and that the, there needs to be rebalancing. And, uh, and similarly, that the judiciary has, has gotten uh, a bit out of, um, out of proportion uh, and that rebalancing that separation of powers has got to be um, part of the, the project. So again, thank you, um, the Jeffs, um, for this great project. And I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you so much. Caroline, for that great um, introduction. Uh, Ilya Shapiro, you have been showered with uh, praise from Jeff Yass as uh, having written uh, his favorite constitution. Um, your value, which you emphasized, uh, was unsurprisingly liberty um, as, a, as a good libertarian. Tell us more about how you put liberty first in your constitution and some of the central proposals that you offered up. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and it's great to be back with you and Carolyn and uh, Elon. Uh, I imagine in the post-COVID time, maybe we can go on, a, an, on an actual physical road show talking to people about the Constitution, because it's not just about getting people to like the Constitution. Before you do that, you have to get them to understand it. Um, and, you know, Americans revere their Constitution, surveys say, but they don't really understand what's in it. And that's part of our project before we even get to how to uh, improve it. Uh, and yeah, I, I do agree with uh, with Jeff. Um, uh, you know, not because he's uh, the funder of this or a, a sponsor of Cato for that matter, but that just happens to be where my views are and where I think the views of the founders are. The fundamental ethos of the American experiment is how do you construct a government to secure and protect our liberties, and that's why, uh, as Jeff said, the, the the Constitution we have is fundamentally a libertarian, small l libertarian, or more precisely classical liberal document. And we did joke that all we needed to do was add, and we mean it at the end of every clause. After all, the constitution to secure and protect our liberty sets out a government of limited and enumerated finite powers that are divided horizontally among the three branches of the federal government, and then vertically in a federalist system that both recognizes and limits the sovereignty of states to protect, as the Declaration puts it, the blessings of liberty. Uh, and, and that original structure provided a mechanism to, pro to preserve the full range of individual liberties because it uh, largely withheld from the government the power to violate them. But that wasn't complete. It certainly wasn't perfect. Uh, we had the big contradiction uh, to the ethos of the American experiment, slavery. And so it took the post-Civil War Reconstruction Amendments to advance, complete that project by extending the Constitution's libertarian guarantees to protect against state violations, of which slavery is the biggest for sure, but there are uh, many others. Now, as Jeff also said, in the intervening 230 years or 150 years since the Civil War, certainly uh, certain deficiencies have arisen, both in terms of uh, interpretation and in terms of things that we've learned about how uh, government structure is structured, and therefore we clarified and sharpened certain provisions. For example, the power, Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce, which is supposed to be a limitation to regulating only things that were truly interstate and truly commerce, but it's been transformed into a charter of expansive federal power far beyond that uh, originally envisioned. And then we tinkered a little bit. We couldn't help but add in a few and we mean it provisions, uh, liberty, liberty enhancing reforms suggested by such scholars as Randy Barnett and Milton Friedman. For example, if there's a, a super majority of states that don't like a federal law, they can uh, uh, collectively uh, repeal it, things uh, like that. And we borrowed some things from state constitutions that we felt uh, were good as well. But, but overall, um, you know, it, it ain't broke and it's not a matter so much of fixing it, but tweaking it, sharpening it, clarifying what underlying is a, a very good structure and a very good system for securing and protecting our liberty, enabling uh, human flourishing. Thank you very much for that. 
Ilan Worman, a team conservative, chose as its central value Madisonian deliberation, the value that Jeff Yass flagged at the outset, and indeed the value that Madison put at the core of the Constitution. When the framers called the convention to Philadelphia, they had in mind the fear of armed mobs attacking uh, government buildings. Shays Rebellion in 1787, uh, farmers in Western Massachusetts who were mobbing the courthouses because they didn't want to pay their debts, so uh, alarmed the founders that they called a constitution to slow down deliberation to prevent uh, passionate mobs from ruling and ensuring that citizens could be guided by reason rather than passion. Tell us about why Team Conservative chose to put Madison, Madisonian deliberation front and center. And just to tee up our next round of questions, because it was your central focus, what are some of the guardrails that you propose strengthening that in your view would resurrect the Madisonian deliberation that the framers expected? Yeah, thanks again so much for having me here uh, on this panel and, and in this project. Uh, and I think you actually stated the case for me quite quite well in your lead up uh, to, to, to my remarks. And I think, you know, we hear uh, from the progressive constitution that their focus was equality and democracy, you know, enhancing democracy, democratic uh, uh, um, responsiveness. Uh, and from the libertarians, you heard liberty. And I think from the conservative perspective, we recognize that a government, a constitution like ours, is going to be a, is going to have to contend with what is an inescapable tension among these competing values. Liberty and equality are in tension, at least if equality means equality of outcome, as, as the other Jeff mentioned earlier, that you have to take something from someone else. But I'm not sure that's what the founders had in mind for equality. I think equality and liberty for the founders were similar. They believed in equality under the law, equality in rights. Um, so I don't think that was so much attention for the founders. But liberty and self-government, I do think our intention, liberty and democracy are intention. You want to create a constitution that creates a society, the conditions in which we the people can govern ourselves so that we can decide who we want to be socially, morally, economically, culturally, politically. On the other hand, we also want to preserve a large measure of liberty, a large measure of natural right. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten into this thing called civil society and out of the state of nature if we'd given up too much of our natural right. And so I will respectfully disagree um, with, with my friend and colleague, Ilya. I, I don't think the Constitution is originally conceived as a libertarian constitution. I think the constitution uh, that the founders created uh, creates a balance uh, between self-government and liberty. Uh, the constitution, of course, protects against government those rights most essential to free society, right? First Amendment rights, speech, press, religion, assembly, petition, self-preservation rights in the Second Amendment, and then a lot of due process rights. But other than that, I think for the most part, the founders left most things, the, the constitution leaves most things to the democratic process uh, and at least at the, at the state level. So our focus was on how do we create a constitution that maybe better strikes this balance between self-government and liberty. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll conclude or partly conclude by saying self-government isn't the same thing as democracy. It's not the same thing as democratic accountability. Self-government itself sort of has this meaning uh, uh, that, that creates this tension. On the one hand, we want our government to be accountable to the people. Right? We want our government uh, to be derived from the people. Uh, and so we want government to be responsive to the people. But we also don't want popular passions leading uh, our, 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 our statesmen and women uh, um, you know, by, by the collar. And so we can see this tension today. Half the country, you know, maybe the same, half the country thinks our elected representatives are insufficiently responsive to the people. And that's how we got President Trump, but we got Donald Trump elected as president in 2016, this populist uprising. The other half, you know, seems to think uh, that it's it's too responsive, it's too populist. Uh, it's, they're too much, uh, uh, the popular passions are leading, leading uh, our elected officials. And so our focus is a balance. Self-government is about being responsive to the popular will, but it's, it's about filtering the popular will. It's about, as Madison said in Federalist 10, refining and enlarging the public view. 
And so um, I know I've gone on uh, uh, for, for a bit too long with this answer. So the key here is deliberation. How do we get the people, the people's representatives to deliberate about the common good? And so the most uh, radical proposal, and there was serious disagreement um, among our mini constitutional convention about this, was we double down on the nature of the Senate. We triple down on the nature of the Senate. We make the Senate one senator from each state, so it'd be only 50 senators. We make one nine-year term ineligible for re-election. We require our senators to take a pledge to promote the national good, the long-term national good, and not the interest of any sort of sect or, or party. Uh, and um, well, we do we try to require them to be present when there are proceedings going on. And then the biggest thing we fight it over was whether they would deliberate and vote in secret. Uh, but we eventually decided that that would be too much in one direction uh, against responsiveness to the people. So we got rid of, of that requirement. But, but deliberation here is the key. It's about balancing liberty and self-government. It's about balancing responsiveness to the people, responsiveness to the people with refining and enlarging uh, the, the, the popular uh, passions. And there's lots more I can say on, on safeguards. We have a three-fifths voting mechanism, which I hope uh, we can uh, get into at some point. But I think I've said enough, at least initially. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to all of you for setting up your constitution so well. Um, Caroline, I certainly did not make, want to make the case for any of the three constitutions in quoting Madison. As all of you know, I have no views whatsoever and I'm merely a pencil but ears as your faithful moderator. But uh, I did um, claim or assert that when the framers called the constitutional convention, they were concerned about mobs inflamed by demagogues. Madison had spent the summer before 1787 um, reading a trunk of books that Jefferson sent from Paris about the failed democracies of Greece and Rome. And that's why he said in Federalist 55, in all large assemblies of any character composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. So here is my question to you, and I'm going to ask it to each of your colleagues. Uh, I would love it at the Constitution Center to keep this great Constitution drafting initiative going this year, and if we can get the we can get the support to do that, I'd love to ask all of your teams to identify guardrails of democracy um, in the wake of uh, January 6th and the recent passions that we have seen inflamed uh, by an armed mob storming the Capitol and ask each of you whether you think there are particular proposals, either ones you've already identified or new ones, that would strengthen guardrails of democracy uh, to um, increase thoughtful deliberation rather than, um, rather than populist passions. Is that, is that a project or an enterprise that the progressive team uh, would accept? And, and, and if you're interested in that project, are, are there, what are the kinds of reforms either that you've already identified or that you could imagine that might resurrect the guardrails of democracy? So I actually, I think um, uh, January 6th uh, uh, really raises a lot of the, uh, it sort of is, is a symbol of, of, of where the failures have been, uh, obviously. And I think that it shows that when the democracy doesn't function, it produces the mob. It's not in this case that the mob is being produced because they're all participating in democracy. It's because our democracy has not functioned. Um, and we look back at the election and we see in, in how many ways um, it didn't uh, uh, run uh, well at all. Um, and I, you know, I, we, in, our, um, in our constitution, one of the things that we do uh, is we get rid of the electoral college. Uh, the disconnect between the popular vote and the electoral college produces so much uh, disagreement um, uh, among Americans, even though the votes are countable, the Electoral College is countable, and yet that dis discord produces uh, 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 this sort of phenomenon uh, of fake news and so forth, as well as the fact that we have no kind of national standards for, um, for how we run elections. Um, our constitution doesn't mandate it, mandate such a thing, but it definitely requires uh, a lot makes it much more possible for there to be a national standard for, for example, how what would ballots look like? When would they arrive? And when would they be counted? So the sort of thing that Congress uh, can and, and, and should take on. Um, but also, I think one of the phenomenon uh, phenomena that uh, uh, is apparent is the ex extreme polarization 
uh, that led to those uprisings, the ability of certain members of Congress to speak to a very um, isolated community um, that was following a Twitter feed that was uh, in inflammatory and erroneous. Um, if we had a national commission uh, to, uh, to set electoral districts, as we propose in our constitution, you could create electoral districts for members of Congress uh, that would actually not uh, be so easily manipulated by partisans and therefore so prone to the, um, to the excessive polarization that produces uh, a, a number of, of members of Congress um, who I won't name, but who, um, who acted in a way that um, uh, many would argue, and not just progressives, was counter uh, to our very democracy and very destructive. Um, so, I mean, there are a number of other areas, but I think certainly strengthening the, uh, the, 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 the functioning of our electoral democracy would actually be the thing that makes democracy function and not be the mob. Um, people would have uh, greater trust uh, in, how the, in how the system had functioned and know that the results that they were seeing were actually produced um, uh, by a system that uh, was counting their vote. Uh, that there weren't excessive uh, barriers in place because we also protect the right to vote explicitly in our constitution. Um, so in essence, you know, I, I would argue that what we saw uh, was rather than the mob being encouraged by democracy here, the mob was encouraged by a very flawed system uh, that a real democracy would have avoided. Thank you for that extremely constructive answer. And the reforms that you just identified uh, reforming the electoral college, national standards for how we run elections, a national commission to set electoral districts that could uh, reduce partisan manipulation and uh, other strengthening the functions of our democracy are exactly the kind of practical solutions that are helpful to talk about uh, as a matter of first principles rather than partisanship. Um, so uh, Ilya, same question to you. If we were to reconvene and ask team libertarian to identify uh, guardrails of democracy that could uh, help us be guided by thoughtful deliberation rather than uh, uh, passion, rather than irrational passions, uh, what would some of those reforms be? Well, I don't think the events of January 6th or the entire lame duck period um, showed any flaws in the constitutional system. So I don't think uh, it would change or, or, or trigger any reform proposals, any amendments in, in how we uh, conduct, uh, structure our government constitutionally. Uh, fundamentally, what we've seen is a, a low level of social trust in our society, polarization, uh, even geographical polarization. Um, you know, if, if the results have gone the other way, if Donald Trump had somehow managed to win another inside straight with an even bigger popular vote loss, I think the the violence and, and rioting uh, on the left would have been probably even bigger than, than what we saw on January 6th. I mean, that's a you know, counterfactual and everything, but we have deep problems in this country, but I don't think they're constitutional. In terms of actual reforms, I don't think it's about the Electoral College, because imagine al massive allegations of voter fraud where it's just uh, amassing large number of votes in the most popular, most populous cities, you know, LA, New York, Chicago, uh, Dallas, Houston, etc. It's not you know, multiple states that have to be each hacked in various different ways in a conspiracy. This is what made the whole, uh, you know, Trumpian attack implausible because you can't, you know, have a, you know, the conspiracy that big just doesn't, there's no evidence of it. And, and it, it, it's very complicated. Whereas in a pure popular vote system, uh, I think that would spread even more distrust. So what kind of reforms could we have or what the kind of reforms did this lame duck or, or January, uh, January 6th uh, events uh, trigger? Well, I think the Electoral Count Act of 1887, that whole thing about uh, senators and congressmen objecting and the way the electoral votes are counted, yeah, that needs to be uh, reworked. The way that states themselves count their ballots, provide their mail-in or other ballots, that needs to be clarified, transparent, known to everyone, publicized, so that people can get buy-in and understand exactly how the processes work. Look at Florida, which in 2000, Bush v. Gore, right, Everyone was focusing on, you know, the, the maladministration, not even anything nefarious, but incompetence and bad regulation of the election itself. They reformed, they overhauled, and in 2020, they were this, you know, swing state, big state, was ready with its count 
uh, the same evening, just hours after polls closed, whereas so many states could not do that, in part because in some states, you're not allowed to count mail-in or absent ballots, which in COVID were a large number, until after polls closed, which is not good policy. But again, these are kind of technocratic election administration governance issues. They are not fundamental issues about guardrails of democracy or constitutional amendment. Thank you very much for that helpful response. You just reminded us that resurrecting guardrails might not only involve constitutional reform, but could involve statutory reforms like the Electoral Count Act or uh, questions of uh, ballot counting. And of course, we could also add to the conversation questions about the responsibility of social media in contributing to polarization and allowing the hasty formation of online mobs and disinformation, which represented Madison's nightmare. It was after all, Madison thought that the large size of America would make it hard for, for mobs to find each other. And by the time they organized, they'd get so tired that they would go home. And the speed which, with which, with, with which um, disinformation spreads on social media um, undermines that Madisonian uh, hope. So that's, that's very constructive. Um, Ilan. Uh, I'm going to ask you once again for the for guardrail suggestions. You already talked about your proposals for the Senate. The conservative constitution, like the progressive, also proposes replacing the electoral college with a national popular vote. You, your language is on the first Tuesday of November, the state shall conduct a national popular vote among the candidates. So qualifying the candidate who obtains a majority of popular votes by method of ranked choice voting shall be elected president. Here's my question. In this guardrails discussion, might it be interesting to basically see if you can agree with one or two of the other teams on the language of one or two amendments, basically have a mock convention. And in particular, I'm gonna ask you, could you imagine agreeing on language for a national popular vote for president that uh, Caroline might embrace because it, it seems like the two of you have already proposed language that's pretty similar. So, so what do you think of that idea of a kind of convention? And are there any other? Um, and 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 then I'll just say you also propose 18-year term limits for Supreme Court justices. Might it be interesting to see whether you and Team Progressive could agree on language for those two amendments? Yeah. So let me uh, talk about maybe four four things where I actually think uh, that's particularly responsive. Uh, to the question, uh, and where there's actually some possibility of agreement, if we're actually thinking of a real life uh, constitutional uh, uh, amendment. And so I'll start with the most possible, the, mo the most plausible uh, is 18 years staggered terms for the Supreme Court justices, right? Nine year, uh, um, nine justices, fi fix it at nine justices, 18 year staggered terms, such that every two years, uh, a president gets a, a, a nominee. There, there are some arguments against this, right? And by the way, after the, the term, they have the choice to go back to an inferior court. So you still have the lifetime tenure, you know, and, and salary uh, uh, protections. I think uh, this would take the temperature down uh, of confirmation battles significantly. And I think it's important to take the temperature down. Uh, if what we're talking about is, is, is partisan, hyper-partisan disagreement and popular passions, I think this is a sensible way uh, to take the temperature downs out of a hugely controversial, uh, ongoing structural issue. Uh, and so uh, I think that that's plausible. Another candidate, and I'll get to the Electoral College in a, in a moment, uh, we propose a series of three-fifths voting requirements in our constitution. What, what, is, what are we trying to do here? We're basically trying to identify specific areas in which we think there must be some bipartisan purchase. There must be some bipartisan um, um, buy-in here to, to these things. But other than that, we, we can get rid of the filibuster. We don't, we don't need bipartisan uh, buy-in for every piece of legislation, uh, ordinary legislation. We do maintain the filibuster in our, in our draft. We require it to be a talking filibuster, which by the way, is the obvious solution to the problem of the filibuster, right? We should of course still have a filibuster, but increase the cost of a filibustering, actually stand there, have to take the floor and so on. Right now, you just say, I want a filibuster and that's it. And 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 so this obviously uh, would, would be the solution. But other than that, we say certain things like creating new states requires a three-fifths vote in our constitution. Uh, impeachment, by the way, we make impeaching um, more difficult, but conviction easier than under the current constitution by giving a three-fifths requirement for both. 
There should be some bipartisan buy-in to impeach to begin with and then to convict. And so we make it harder to impeach from the majority vote that's currently required, but easier to convict from the two thirds that's, that's currently uh, required. And, and I think this is one of our most sensible proposals, these various three fifths uh, mechanisms. Uh, before I get to the Electoral College, I also say it's a legislative veto because I, it's sort of a hobby horse of mine. And I think the progressives had this in their constitution too. Just this idea that Congress increasingly delegates to the executive uh, and the executive makes lots of rules and regulations that affect private conduct and behavior. Why not give Congress a back end legislative veto on regulations that affect private rights? This is unconstitutional today under INS v. Chadha, which I think was correctly decided. But in our new constitutions, why not have a legislative veto? So that would be an interesting uh, room for agreement. I'm hesitant, uh, uh, and I don't want to disappoint you, <laughs> Jeff, on the Electoral College, because it was basically a two to two disagreement among our many constitutional uh, convention. Uh, so originally, we sort of had two proposals there. One is we wanted a role for the states, a role for the parties, and then a role for the people. So our original conception was that the state legislatures would nominate candidates, and they would cast a vote, and then we that gives you the nominees. The parties themselves would then select the candidates, and then we'd have a national popular vote among the, 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 the two, three candidates um, that, that we have. Uh, we D disagreed uh, in terms of whether we want to mention political parties in our constitution. And so we ended up taking the parties out, but we think the parties are going to be there in the background organizing the state legislatures. So the bottom line is we don't want a national popular vote unless at the first step, at the nomination step, we have some uh, role for the states as states or the parties as parties, something to still give the small states a purchase in, an, in a national uh, election, which we think they wouldn't have uh, if it was a pure national popular vote. So the short answer is yes, I think there can be some agreement on it, but it will be harder to come to that agreement than you might think. Fascinating and so helpful for you to give us that insight into the process of your own deliberation. It picks up on one of the questions in our Q&A box. I'd love to understand more about how about the process each team took to their deliberation and drafting, and whether they all took the same approach or if each came at the process differently. And I'd be curious about how much current events or the public discourse in the past several years influenced their drafts, if at all. Uh, friends, we have time just for basically for closing statements. Um, so I'm gonna let you leave our, our audience with the thoughts you'd like, but because I do wanna keep this moving forward, I'm gonna ask you um, um, first if you, or, uh, accept uh, the, the Constitution Center's invitation to uh, continue to convene and discuss. And what structure uh, do you think would be most productive uh, for our continuing conversation? We, we could simply ask, give the three teams a homework assignment, like come up with uh, guardrails of democracy that uh, you think should be strengthened, constitutional, statutory, or technological, essentially, they could, and, and then you could present. Or uh, in the course of it, I think it would be interesting if you could convene in a Zoom convention format and see if there's anything that you can agree on uh, in proposals, as well as uh, focusing your disagreement. But um, I'm going to let each of you uh, give your thoughts about how best to structure this. Carolyn, uh, first to you. Oh, well, great. Thank you. And, and thanks for a great conversation. Um, I did want to just respond to one of the questions in the Q&A, because I think it brings us into this conversation, which is just to say, our team was just three. Um, uh, I think the, the conservatives had four because, well, I don't know, because they have four um, uh, and we all had three. Um, it's just a fluke um, of, 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 let's just say, uh, the, conserv the progressives and the libertarians just worked faster <laughs> with fewer people. Um, just to make a little joke on your expense, Elon. Um, <laughs> but so there were just three of us, but we did consult widely. Um, we wanted to make sure that what we were um, bringing uh, to the discussion and to our draft was um, as informed as possible uh, around issues facing many different communities um, uh, and scholars who are expert uh, on, on, on those. So, you know, in, in respect to the rights of indigenous, indigenous peoples, um, that's certainly something that was very present in our minds uh, to look at how the Constitution has regulated um, uh, 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 Native Americans and, and so forth. So, um, uh, so we did, we did talk with uh, a number of people. I think 
Um, but the other thing about our process was that we, we had also rather envisioned our draft as, a, as something like the Virginia plan uh, in that it's a basis for further discussion. Um, you know, we, we did spend a number of months um, through our, um, our conversations with each other and with, um, with other scholars, uh, um, but it, 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 it doesn't mean that it's the last word even for the progressives and that um, could, we, uh, could we refine it? Could we come up with language that could be shared among conservatives and libertarians? Possibly. Um, so, you know, I guess my, my gut tells me that it might be better for us to have a uh, a kind of a, 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 a plan of our own in advance of a convention. Hmm. Um, because I think uh, a wide open convention among conservatives, libertarians, and progressives might not um, structured in that way uh, come to conclusions. Whereas a convention that was respecting certain language in certain areas where we were already fairly close we might actually get some um, real um, uh, get to some a place where we could put something forward that uh, uh, that might look almost like a final draft. So that would be my gut, but I'm certainly open to anything, and I'm very eager to continue to participate. I think it's been a wonderful project, and uh, uh, I've enjoyed it very much, and have found it very stimulating, and I think a great um, public education exercise. Wonderful, such a constructive suggestion. Just as you said, uh, Virginia and New Jersey had plans that they brought to the convention to debate, it would, I think it would indeed be constructive to ask the teams first to propose plans and then to convene. Ilya, next one to you. I know you, you all of us are reading the Q&A, so you can pick up on any questions you want. Um, and um, uh, what are your thoughts about moving this forward? And how can we ensure that Team Libertarian, which may not want to propose constitutional reforms, has an opportunity to propose statutory or technological uh, reforms as well? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you do give us more homework, um, then, uh, yeah, I think we'll come back to you with all sorts of, you know, probably not constitutional reforms, but, you know, states should reform their electoral laws and we should promote transparency and it's not necessarily a role for government. I mean, government, uh, at the end of the day can only do so much, um, uh, let alone uh, uh, constitutional changes. Um, picking up on Carolyn's joke about Team Conservative, for a long time we thought that they would submit, uh, they weren't turning in their drafts, so they were going to come up at the end of the day with an unwritten constitution like the British have, but ultimately they did submit something. But really, you know, it's surprising that Team Conservatives were the one who couldn't follow directions. You're supposed to have three people, not four, and that's why you had your, your two to two splits. Um, uh, all joking aside, I mean, I, I was surprised by Team Conservative that they didn't focus on virtue. I mean, Madisonian deliberation, yeah, I'm about that. You know, Madison's great. I, my license plate on my car is Fed 51, Federalist 51. If men are angels, you know, et cetera, men aren't angels. And so you have to have these internal checks. That's great. That's kind of political science, political theory 101. But where is the virtue? There's reference a reference to senators pledging an oath to uh, the common good or the national good, well, that's as good as the current general welfare clause. No senator is going to say that they're acting against uh, any uh, of those things. Uh, and and with, the, with the progressive constitution, uh, there's a lot of good things in there, a lot of uh, 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 very good intentions, but then there's a notwithstanding clause. That is that democracy, the majority can trump individual rights. And I think that's dangerous and frankly, uh, irreconcilable. I come from Canada. There's a notwithstanding clause in the Canadian Constitution, which I think has done uh, a lot of damage. I like to say that, like most immigrants, I do a job uh, that most native-born Americans don't, and that's uh, probably the present company ex accepted, and that's uh, defending the Constitution. Uh, but in the long run, um, look, the problems we faced, uh, it's similar to what I wrote about in the particular case in my book, Supreme Disorder, about why we have these very fraught uh, judicial confirmation battles. Uh, it's not because senators are more de demagogic now than they were 200 years ago. It's not because uh, you know Supreme Court's more important. It, it is in, in a sense, but what you have is a centralization of power in Washington, a skewing of that power towards the administrative branch, the executive branch, people that can only be sued, they can't be unelected. And at the same time, uh, divergent interpretive theories that map onto partisan preferences at a time when the parties are more ideologically sorted than ever. And that uh, uh, diagnosis for our judicial battles, I think parallels our diagnosis for our politics writ large. Um, and I think the only solution is to not have that aggregated power in Washington. Let California be California and Texas be Texas. Let uh, 
uh, Congress decide more of the truly national things rather than giving it to the deputy undersecretary of, of such and such. You know, uh, and that's why fundamentally uh, the constitutional structure we already have just with those and we mean it uh, sharpenings is is what it has to come down to. But going forward, yeah, I mean, let's limit executive power, absolutely. Um, uh, but I don't think that's inconsistent with what I've just said. Thank you very much for all that. Ilan, last word to you. You've got some uh, friendly uh, jibes to uh, respond to and then a, a great invitation from Ilya to uh, address the central question of virtue, because after all, as, as Ilya says, the founders thought that unless citizens could muster virtue, by which they meant the ability of to govern their own irrational and unreasonable passions so that they could serve uh, the public good as well as uh, finding concern for others, then the system would collapse. And that's why they thought civic education in general and education about the constitution in particular was so important. I'm gonna ask you to be tight, uh, Ilan, because we're, we're almost out of time, but give us a great conservative send off for what you'd like to see with this wonderful project moving forward. Yeah, uh, so thanks again. So I just wanted to make sure, I, I, Ilya might have left you with the impression that there is a general welfare clause in the constitution. There isn't. Uh, if you want to get really originalist, there's a taxing clause that allows Congress to tax for specified purposes, including for the general welfare. If you want to get more modern and less originalist, then there's a spending clause, which allows Congress independently to spend for the general welfare. But there's no just freestanding general welfare clause. So we think our pledge does do work. And by the way, we do reintroduce uh, appointment by the state legislatures, and maybe that will also conduce to the virtue uh, of, of this so ruling class in, in the Senate, uh, if you will. But for the most part, where else can we put virtue? The whole point of the Constitution is to create the conditions in which virtue can exist, in which virtue can flourish. But, but you can't compel it. You can't compel it. You can't put it into the Constitution uh, in, in any sort of way. Uh, on the 2-2, by the way, it's true. We had some scheduling difficulties, but I'll also say there was just a lot more to disagree about maybe as conservatives. You know, do you mention God? Do you mention abortion? Do you mention affirmative action? Do you mention national university and civic education? Or, you know, do you just recognize that it's about creating the conditions for ordinary politics? So there was a lot of, a lot of debate there. As for next steps, I will say, I think we should focus on specific propositions for example, a legislative veto, uh, courts staggered to, to, to staggered 18-year uh, terms, and we should just focus on those two or three things. I think executive power is one of them. And then maybe we could have another one of these sessions, kind of like under the Administrative Procedure Act, have a public notice and comment period. I just feel bad, you know, there are so many wonderful questions we didn't get to, and we could incorporate that and then reconvene as a, as a, as a Zoom convention to, to incorporate the feedback uh, that we hear. And I think that would be a nice way to proceed. Wonderful. Uh, beautifully said, the idea of a Zoom convention maybe preceded by public comment would be wonderful. Friends in the audience, your questions were so great. Please know that all of us were taking close note of them and will perhaps reintroduce them when we reconvene as we very much hope to do. I am so grateful to Jeff Yas for having made this program possible for, to Debbie Gatte for having brought all of us together to talk about the project and are really looking forward to keeping it moving over the year ahead. And I'm going to turn the camera over to Debbie for some final words. Well, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Ilan, Ilya, and Caroline. That was a really wonderful. And yes, uh, there were many, many, many questions coming in for us. It's clear that this conversation um, is one that people want to have and they want to talk about the details and they really want to understand the various perspectives. So when we think back to the original constitutional conventions, this was not easy work and uh, there was a real dedication involved. So I love the idea of finding the two or three issues that this project has already revealed as being potential places to start and focusing there. And I'm getting lots of comments about excitement around a Zoom constitutional convention to explore that. So I know this is not the end. I'm, I'm excited that there are next steps, Jeff. Thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you to our the Jeff Yost who made this possible. And we, we're going to keep talking. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.